As many? The Chair recognizes the Honorable Member for Fox Hill. Uh, Mr. Speaker. Um, I intend largely to respond to various interventions that have been made today and before on various matters, largely in my role as the Minister responsible for nationality matters and for immigration. I would normally have had a, a more expansive uh, intervention, but having regard to the tone of what has transpired, I'm seeking to restrain what I would say in what I would normally, normally consider to be the freest forum in the country. And uh, I do so because I have a lot of respect for the Progressive Liberal Party as an organization. Uh, there are three organizations that I belong to voluntarily. One is the Anglican Church, into which I was christened. The other, the Progressive Liberal Party, which I joined and the third, the Elks, where I was joined, uh, but I choose to remain in voluntarily. And I believe that the Progressive Liberal Party is an organization of integrity. It is a rational organization. There is a great deal of propaganda that's been spread over the decades about what did and didn't happen. And I would like given some of the interventions that were made uh, in this place to respond to that at the end if there's time. This subject, of course, is impatient of debate, which is an expression that I first heard from uh, Michael Manley, and I use it here to say the subject is impatient of debate. I can think of many, many things I could have been doing today, which is a Monday normally set aside for my constituents. Uh, but instead, we are here on a Monday. The leader of the government business would tell you that at the start of this term, one of the strongest arguments I made is that we ought to be able to so manage our time that we really confine the days of the House to Wednesday and Thursday, so that Monday is actually dedicated to constituents, the people who send us here. And yet, because of the way this debate has turned on something which I have insisted in the public domain is irrelevant to this debate, we are, in some senses, derailed. And um, the subject that is caused so much sensitivity is one which many people, friend and foe alike, with regard to me, are very nervous for me to speak about or introduce. I have had to address my constituents on this subject before and tell them, you know, don't be concerned about me, my future, my ability to, to defend myself and all the rest of it on that particular subject the so-called unspeakable vice, because I have learned to be able to defend myself from the time I was a child on these matters. That hasn't stopped people from uh, going down that road, but that's life. But don't be concerned about it. And uh, it's unfortunate. The member for uh, Angliston was telling me that there's some piece which is circulating, which took place on Friday on one of the radio stations. And she suggested that perhaps a formal complaint ought to be made uh, to the authorities who are responsible for the content of radio shows about the conduct of that particular program. But I have always ignored these matters, except to the extent that it is an affront personally to me. Uh, and then I will choose to defend myself. Uh, so I stand to be advised on, on that matter. 
But as I said, this matter is really impatient of debate. And I had always thought that this was a matter of party discipline, nothing else. I thought the leader of our party came to us and said that we had struck a bargain with the free national movement, the other side in this house. That bargain was based on an underlying assumption that the Constitutional Commission had been delegated the work of discerning after going throughout the country, of determining what would be the best way to accomplish the objective of equality for women. The Constitutional Commission, therefore, did their work. And so there was no work for us to do. Once that package was agreed, the two political parties agreed on the package. The whole idea, I thought, was to come to the House, we would vote on that package up or down, and then go to the country and say, we are agreed that this is the position and this should be supported, and that would be the end of that. So it was a question of whether the Right Honorable Prime Minister could deliver the members who supported him, and whether the Honorable Leader of the Opposition could deliver the members who supported him. He understood that there would be some little chipping away, some horse trading on the question of a little politics and so on and so forth, but essentially we were agreed that we would sell this package. And that's, I thought, was the end of that. I didn't think I would even have to say a single word about it. Uh, I was not going to be my own lawyer and say that this word meant this and that word meant the next thing. The Constitutional Commission did that, and that was supposed to be the end of that. Suddenly, sex became sexual preference, and sex became sexual orientation. How those two got mixed up in that, I have no idea. Except that, for good or ill, what it has had the effect of doing is derailing where we were headed, is the idea of equality for women, a word that had been judicially decided and means simply male and female. An excerpt was read from one of the conventions that we've signed. Uh, I don't recall the paragraph myself, but I listened carefully to the words as they were read here today. And the meaning that I got was certainly not the one that was positive. It appears to me that it is not in mandatory terms, but in discretionary terms, in the sense that it sets a benchmark, or it says to a country that signed the convention that this is where you should be going. So if you are fulfilling all the aspects of the convention, if you want to go in a particular direction, you can, because not only is sex simpliciter, but there are other things associated with it. That's the way uh, it seemed to me it read. But nevertheless, as I say, I'm not my own lawyer, and I'm not going to pretend to be lawyer in this. The Constitutional Commission made the recommendations, and I stand by their recommendations. I'm not going behind them. And I've urged my constituents to support the four bills without amendment. It doesn't seem to me they need any amendment. And any amendment to define sex to me seems superfluous. I spoke to a church in my constituency yesterday. And I reminded them that the IDB told us in 2012 that there were 15,000 more women, 15,000 and change, more women on the rolls in the last general election than men. Approximately 10% more of the electorate is female than male. And uh, that is more than the split in the natural population. So it means that men have not been registering at the same rate as they are a, a proportion of the population. As in many things, women are simply more engaged in the life of the community. And I said to them, so if every man votes no, 
If every man votes no, and every woman votes yes, that means the yes carries. And I shall be going throughout Fox Hill if I'm invited to come along to go to other areas of the country and invite men and women to vote yes for these four bills. Whatever the question. I don't know that the question is relevant. I'm satisfied the commission did its work, and whatever they present, they're not going to fool us that they're going to deliver what they said we're going to deliver. Now, the member for Montague uh, raised uh, a quote which I gave when I spoke to a church in Fox Hill. I told the story of the film Womanish Ways. And in that film, a woman who's in the Alps with me today, she's many, many years senior from where she was. But she recalls in the 1950s, or recalled in the film in the 1950s, that Mabel Walker was her leader in the Alps. And she said something like this. Ms. Walker came to us and said, women should have the vote. And she was putting, sending around a petition, and she wanted us to sign the petition. She says, we didn't know what Ms. Walker was talking about, but Ms. Walker was our leader. And she said, a sign, so we signed. Signed the petition, women now have the vote. And I said that that is what leadership is all about. Leaders, people trust leaders are supposed to have implicit trust. I'm not saying that you're supposed to jump off a cliff, but what I'm saying is that in every organization, in a trade union, in a political party, there are certain things which you delegate to the person who leads your group. Many times when I'm sitting in a cabinet or sitting within a party caucus, there are many things which I don't agree with which I don't support. In fact, sometimes I think people try and make sure I'm not around because my views are so strong on various matters, it's better to do it while I'm not here. I mean, people do that. Yeah. You know? <laughs> sometimes they say to you, sometimes they say to you, <laughs> you know, sometimes they say to you, look, if you got a problem with it, when the vote comes, go step outside. So you don't have to have, to have a clash between conscience and, and duty to party. So there are constant compromises which are being made to be part of an organization. And one of those compromises is this trust that I was saying in the leader of your organization. It makes for greater efficiency. And I'm saying that on some of those, some issues, and I think this is one of those that we have to be so efficient in carrying this out now. It is so important for this to be done that this is one of those areas where the leader of the opposition ought to have the implicit trust and support of the members on his side, and the leader of the government, the right honorable prime minister on this side, ought to have the implicit trust of his members for both of them to carry us in the right direction. That's the only point I'm making. And I think that that's the right thing to do in these circumstances. The member for Montague brought up the constitutional talks in 1972. And again, this is part of the political process, so we take no issue. Everyone's got to have their own story. And their story is that they were the ones who were the advocates, the Free National Movement, that is, were the advocates for uh, women and putting this in the Constitution prior to the 1973 Constitution. The point of order that I made when I believe it was the member for Kalani was speaking was this. There was no minority report coming out of the 1972 constitutional talks. There was a unanimous report. The British, the opposition free national movement, and the progressive liberal party. So having regard to that, 
No one party can claim credit for any particular thing that came out of that 1972 conference because we all agreed on it. Now, there may have been discussions, and I don't know who advanced what and so on and so forth, but the fact is the report that came out of the 1972 constitutional talks was a unanimous report of the three parties. So the Constitution we have now is a result of the unanimous support of the three parties to that meeting, the British, the Free National Movement, and the Progressive Liberal Party. Those are the facts. What is also a fact is that no woman attended the conference for the Bahamas. None. Free National Movement, who's now boasting that they put all the stuff about women in the Constitution didn't carry a woman to the conference. Neither, as it turns out, did the Progressive Liberal Party. And you know, Mr. Speaker, I was at a conference in Haiti. The member stands, uh, member Fokalani stand on a point of, point of order. Point of order. Chair recognize the member Fokalani. Yes, the Constitution after it came out in 72, it was a conjoint document. But the point I was making was that there was a difference of opinion between the PLP and the FNM, and the British was basically the referee to resolve the issue. That's the point. But when the document came out, it's the, it's the Constitution. Thank you, Honorable Member. Member for Fox, sir. Please stand on the historic fact. The fact is there was a unanimous report. And I think that when we stood and raised that point the last time, the member was concerned about the assertion that his members left to come home for Christmas and said to the Progressive Liberal Party, you settle it, we agree, you settle it. That's a fact too. But the point that I'm also saying is this. As recently as this year, I'm sitting, uh, I was dispatched to go to Port-au-Prince for a meeting with the Haitian government. And we're sitting there at the formal opening of the meeting. And the opening statements are being done. And it gets to be my turn. And I say, without thinking about it, I say, ladies and gentlemen, good morning. And then I looked around the room. There wasn't a single woman in the room. No one from the Haitian side. No one from the Bahamian side. And none of us thought that there was anything. I'm, I'm sure none of us even consciously thought about it. And... You know, I sort of had a half frown on my face a couple weeks before that when the member for Angliston, buttressed by the member for um, Yamacraw, were saying that there was still discrimination against women in the Bahamas. And I was trying to think, well, what the heck are they talking about, discrimination? I mean, they're everywhere. They run everything, you know. We take orders, you know. Yeah. Um, you know, we're the bosses, but they make the decisions. And that, when I saw that happen, I said, I understand now what they're talking about. Is that it appears that if you don't do something, the natural order of things is men run things. All the important aspects of life are controlled by men. And, and, and what that must feel to have you know, acts of discrimination visited upon you for something that you cannot change. You don't pick your gender. That's given to you. So I understood that point. And that's why uh, 41 years on, 42 years on from the constitutional talks in 1972, it's time for us to put in our constitution this fact in law that we recognize in 19, in, sorry, in 2014, that women are equal to men. And I deeply regret, I deeply regret that this extraneous, what I call irrelevant stuff has been introduced into this debate on something which should have been so simple and so straightforward. And what I also regret is that the persons who started it, when we respond to it, say it's our fault for making the tone of the debate what it is. When in fact, it is our responsibility to make sure 
that if a wrong assertion is made, we have a responsibility to correct it if we believe it is wrong. No matter how nervous that makes anyone feel. The fact is, as the member for who, who uh, uh, the member for Angleston, when she spoke, talked, I think when she was talking on the resolution on disabilities, people with disabilities, she said, she read various things in the Constitution, she said, it's the rights of all people. Uh, someone tried to buttonhole me again on this issue, and forgive me if I'm, you know, violating this injunction that I, I received, but, you know, on whether I have, a, a, whether I support a gay rights agenda. And I say, well, what's that? What is that? What I support is the rights for all people. You know, human beings. You know, the kinds of things the member of parliament for Tall Pines was talking about. The right for people to live their lives, peaceful and quiet enjoyment. That's what I support. Not categorizing people here and there and so on and so forth. And this one can't have that one and the next one can't have that. The one thing I wrote the Prime Minister about with this, because I realized that if I got into it, one of the things they would do is blame me for derailing the whole effort. And so everything that I've been working for for decades and decades with regard to this Constitution may in fact be derailed. But I wrote him and I said this, the principle of a Constitution is this. It is a framework document. It is a framework to provide you with how the organs of the state are to relate to one another and to say certain things about the rights which citizens have. So the way the Constitution is presently constructed is it gives a particular generation and parliament the power to prohibit if it wishes or the power to permit if it wishes. I said to him, why would I want to be part of any effort which seeks to bind a generation 50 years down the road. All of these issues we're now dealing with on citizenship. And I remember, because I was a student in Britain in 1972, and I sat in the car with a former minister of the government. And he said at the time, look, boy, we've solved this problem of illegal immigration for the Bahamas. And I said, really? How is that? I was 18 at the time. He says, yeah, um, we... Um, We've decided that if your parents are not Bahamian, you can't be Bahamian, even if you're born in the Bahamas. And I thought, wow, that's a great idea. That'll solve the problem. So here I am now, the gatekeeper, trying to superintend these laws. And I see the eternal bureaucratic nightmare that's been connected with the torturously worded provisions which say who is a citizen of our country to the point where the people at the passport office are confused sometimes, the Department of Immigration is confused. So when, the, the point I'm making here is the laws are what they are. But when we are making laws, we also have to appreciate that someone has to administer those laws. And if you start putting in, you know, playing lawyer and putting this in and that in and the next in, you know the bureaucracy and the nightmare which that adds. And the fact is that we are in this issue today because 41 years ago, the men of that generation decided that that was the right thing for our country. But what it did was it tied our hands so that we have to go through this process now today to resolve the problem. Now, why do I want to put that on someone, some other generation 50 years from now? Why want to do that? What I want is for each parliament to be able to reflect the views and values of its time and for the Constitution to be an enduring document with maximum flexibility that's able to protect and able to prohibit as the demands of public policy and the public interest require given the particular generation. That's all. Not to make it so complicated and so tortuously worded that it's so difficult to administer you can't even understand what it is and then it takes an eternal nightmare and mess for bureaucrats to try and administer it. 
that was the position I wrote to the Prime Minister. The member for Monica raised the question of children. The member for Monica raised in his intervention the question of children of men who are born out of wedlock and their mothers are illegally in the Bahamas. And the question is, what happens to those children? Do the women get a right to stay as a result of those children being Bahamian citizens at birth? This is a matter which, of course, should properly be referred to the Constitutional Commission for its opinion or to the Attorney General. I would only say that the present practice is that a child goes to the parent or goes with the parent who has custody and control of that child. Custody and control of the child. So if the mother has custody and control and the mother is leaving the country, the child goes with the mother. That's the current rule. That's the current policy. And I don't see that there'd be anything to interrupt that unless in law it is possible for a mother to give guardianship to someone and provided there are no social services issues, there's a proper parent for that child, then that is how you would deal with that matter. Perhaps the father, if the father is a Bahamian citizen, then the father can have custody and care and control of the child. But the present law does not ground, and I don't think it's anticipated with a change in the law, that the mother would be able to, to say, I am, have a legal entitlement to stay in the Bahamas because my child is Bahamian. It may in fact be persuasive, but not a legal entitlement. That is my preliminary view. The last thing. I would like to discuss is the integrity of the Progressive Liberal Party. Uh, much was said about, and, and I went to a, a funeral and I heard a lot about the history of what the Progressive Liberal Party did to one of our fallen soldiers. I would only say this, that it is important, Mr. Speaker, always to hear the other side. Hear the other side. My view also is that in some cases it is better to let sleeping dogs lie. To not open up old wounds and to leave the bones buried where they are. In 1977, nine people lost their nominations just before the general election campaign of 1977. As a matter of fact, much of what happened was precipitated by events in August of 1976 when the then leader of the Progressive Liberal Party, Lyndon Pindling, sought to move the public disclosure bill in this house. There was a temporary majority of the opposition. The speaker put the question and the bill was defeated. The House was prorogued, came back. One of the parliamentary secretaries voted to kill the government's bill and lost his job that day. There's a song about it, show and tell. When the nominations came up in 1977, nine people lost their nomination. Amongst them was the late Mr. Edmund Moxie, the chairman of the Progressive Liberal Party at the time was Mr. Hubert Ingle. And I'm saying that those who know the history should just hear the other side. Just hear the other side. You don't have to believe it. Just hear the other side. And I think that at the end of the day, when history, you know, uh, there's been a lot said about what we did and didn't do. The point is that no one in here, 
had any responsibility for what happened. The only member, I wasn't there, the QC who's sitting there, he was there that night and he gave me a blow-by-blow -blow description by phone. I don't know if he remembers it. It went to late hours of the morning. But the only person that I recall by report who spoke up for anyone to save their nominations that night was the right honorable member for Senator. And that, and that I believe had to do with Mr. Franklin Wilson, who for other reasons not connected to, the, to those stories. The relevance is that the integrity of the Progressive Liberal Party was attacked during the course of this debate. And I'm simply saying I'm defending that integrity and making this general point, sir, and no more. This is a rational organization. This is a rational organization. I support the four bills.